Greg Camp, ladies and gentlemen, we are live. <laughs> you did it. We did it. So you were using Safari. We, I, it was there was an error. I didn't know that Streamyard had issues with uh, Safari or whatever your other one was. You said Firefox, I think, too. Yeah. Well, the good news is I have a new thing now, Google Chrome. So. Oh yeah, it's I'm, more tentacles within you. Yeah. Dude, so what's the hat? You say you're doing construction. Well, yeah. So we bought a new house, and um, there was a garage sale. And we stopped to go pick up, you know, like a basketball hoop and a couple of other things they had. And I saw this helmet and it was just so cool. It was like this old school chrome, you know, I don't know, lineman's helmet or something. And so slapped a sticker on it. And yeah, this is what I wear when I'm working on the house. It looks good on you. Thanks, man. I, yeah. I know. Very Maybe in another life. <laughs> For sure. My dad was a fireman. Oh, yeah. It brings back yeah, old school home vibes. So what, you built a new studio? You're building it or you built one out in your house? Well, the, I am in the basement of the house that we bought. And this is just kind of the music room. Like my kids and, and all their friends come over here and we just like play music. And so I haven't actually built the real recording studio. And so and just today I moved all my equipment out of my old studio into this basement, which is not built out yet. And so that's next. What's the studio going to be like? Um, it's going to be a factory, like a, a music making creative zone factory slash painting, get, get oil and acrylic all over yourself and all over the walls and, you know, be creative and there's no rules. Do you set up cameras too? Um, I do have cameras. Yeah. But obviously not today. So it's like you sit down, you've got like your master. I mean, it'll be cool when you have it all set up and we can show it. But like what you've got, like your master suite or is it all like on little computers now? Um, I just use, you know, whatever computers in front of me, you know. I mean, a lot of the Defiant record was done on this laptop that I'm talking to you on right now. I've, I've since retired it from music but uh, and, and bought myself a nice new computer so for people that don't know you're i guess are you rhythm guitar in the defiant do you do you have like a, a dedicated role your songwriter guitarist but like do you put you guys go back and forth on lead you and um i mean there are two guitar players and we just sort of you know pick up whatever task is necessary so. and other people that don't know whether you were in smash mouth and wrote like I mean, some of these like multi, I don't know if they're multi-platinum, but like some of the biggest songs on earth in the nineties that walking on the sun was like that kind of change that like, I don't know if it like created a genre it was like surfer rock. It like, it was the modern iteration of surf rock. What, yeah. What I mean, I, I'm not sure <clears throat> a lot of, there was for a while when that song came out, people would go, where were you the first time you heard walking on the sun? You know, and some people were like, I was on the beach or I was, you know, in my car and I had to pull over a, didn't know what was happening because it was such a weird sound to be coming out on, you know, uh, alternative rock radio. And, and then it crossed over into pop markets and things like that. It was just kind of a weird, you know, thing that happened. Were you like tripping on psychedelics when you wrote it? Absolutely. I mean, Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, the, the strange thing about that particular song was I wrote it um, for the band I was in before Smash Mouth. And the song was vetoed from that band. It was a little too political and, um, you know, it kind of at that point sounded sort of like Latin rock, you know, like almost like Santana or something. So Yeah. And then so you wrote the lyrics, you wrote the guitar. Did you write every aspect of it or did the band take it and add a bunch of stuff to it? Um, I wrote the song, you know, it's like, I mean, when we got it into the studio, um, you know, that song actually wasn't on the first Smash Mouth album until the producer, uh, Eric Ballantyne got on board and he's like, oh, we gotta, we gotta do that song. But, you know, we were kind of doing a Scott Punk thing at the time and it didn't really fit. And so we sort of had to kind of jam it in there. It didn't sound like anything on the album, but, um, yeah, I really, yeah, I, I bought that album and it was like the other songs didn't sound like it. I was like, Oh, I love walking on the sun. I want, did you ever do that? Like back in the day, you'd, you'd hear a song on the radio, you buy the album and be like, doesn't sound like that one pop song that they have on the radio. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, know it, it was, it was the vehicle to get people to go buy the album. And then they bought the album and they were like, what's this, you know, <laughs> that, like metal, you know? The, yeah. 
it was hard. That fush you mang. And then I was wa- I was looking at it. I was like, is that actually fuck you, man? Like, <laughs> hey, you cracked the code, man. I okay, I, I thought so. It took me like 30 years You're to smart. figure that out, 20 years to figure that out. <laughs> fush you, man. You weren't right. even alive when that when that album came out. I was, yeah. I was born in 79. So that was like my formative years. The I got into like music in 91. My dad would play a lot of it in the 80s. He played a lot of Talking Heads, Warren Zevon, yeah. um, Beach Boys. And then, so I was, I was always into like vocal harmonies and weird kind of arithmetic. We were from that Akron sound. My uncle, mm-hmm. Michael Aylward was in a band called Tin Huey, who had like a Sony record in the seventies. I think they did, they had two records and then Sony dropped them. They like, they covered a monkey song and that was their big claim to fame. Hey, we covered a monkey song too. Which one? I'm a believer. Yeah. That's the one they covered too. I'm a believer. Really? When but you was say there, we, was their version in the movie Shrek? I don't think so. No, you guys. Oh, <laughs> Smash Mouth did. I'm a believer. Yeah, we did. I'm a believer, and so we had All Star at the start of the movie, and then we had I'm a believer at the end of the movie. It's like bookends. We we sort of got the best of both worlds. So, what do you think about covering songs in general, like, and putting them on your album? I've always been a fan of that. I've always been a fan of like buying an album and hearing a cover on it. You know, um, you know, I liked Van Halen. I still like Van Halen, and I loved. They were a cover band, pretty much, and it's like they always had a cover on their albums. Really? Yeah, they were a cover band before they were who you who you know that. Really? Are. Yeah. Who would they cover? Everything. The Kinks. You know, it, a lot of blues and stuff. I mean, they were like a party band, and then they started playing their own stuff, and that's how they got their record deal. But I mean, their first their first album has "You're No Good," which is an old song um that linda ronstadt did it um i can't remember who wrote it but and then it had uh the kink song um you really got me it had two covers on that album oh yeah, pretty woman i mean where have all the good times gone they did they love the kinks apparently and then so i i was like i went through a phase in of like oh it's not ethical to play other people's music if i don't if I don't believe it myself, like I'm not, it's not good enough. Well, I'll tell you what, Ian, I, you know, from the time I was in high school, I was in high school. And when I was old enough to drive a car, I was playing in cover bands, 21 and up bar bands all the way through my twenties until Smash Mouth got a record deal. So I made a living at, at other playing other people's music. In fact, I probably owe a lot of people a lot of money for that. Cause did you, when did you get into guitar? uh i don't know i was like maybe in seventh grade eighth grade what like what inspired you to pick it up um i wanted to be a rock star (laughs) Uh, let's see i played drums first and then um my stepfather worked at home and he's like no more drums can't have drums in the house i work at home so drums are out so my mom got me a guitar so i slowly transitioned into guitar and you know was your first guitar like a acoustic? Yeah, it was like a little little Spanish, you know, nylon string guitar. And then what? Like, how long did it take you to get good at it? Well, I mean, I was hitting it with drumsticks for the first couple of years, and then and then I finally figured out. I'm like, oh, I, I actually need to play this thing. So yeah, it is um, a bit. I was in a band when by the time I was in eighth grade, so it only took me a couple of years. What was the band? It was me and a couple other guys. One guy worked at a. a worked at a sporting goods place and the other guy worked at a, at a guitar. It wasn't guitar center. I don't think they had those yet, but some guitar shop. And so we had like all this equipment at our ready. And um, so we started playing like rush and, you know, what, like a lot of prog rock. Cause you know, when you're a kid, you want to be as good as you can. And so you're playing like math rock, you know? Yeah. So. Did you ever play any Primus? Um, it was actually way before Primus. I'm old, dude. Look at this thing. What? Yeah, yeah. You were born in like the '60s. Yeah, I was born yeah, in the '60s. Beard's looking good, dude. <laughs> what? '67? Exactly. Oh, okay, cool. What month? What? What's your birthday? April. April oh, 2nd. what day? Me, I'm April second too. Shut up. What? Dude. Are you left-handed? No. Okay. But I, I try to be ambidextrous. Well, there you go. That's a start. So you're left-handed? Left-handed. Yeah. So it's weird because. Um, our pr- producer of not of Smash Mouth, Eric Valentine, April second, left-handed. We we had all these sort of parallels, and we got along really well. That's why you and I get along so well. 
I bet, man. That's when we first hung out. I was like, oh, he's the guy I get along with the best in the band. Like, I know. We, so the Defiant, you guys all came over to IRL. We were just sat, like sitting down across from each other. It felt like we were like kids in our bedroom, like, and it was like we were like eleven and nine, and like mom was, was sitting this right. That was a fun day, man. That's like one of the, one of the best days I've had in a long time. With Chicken City, um, poker. Even though I, I suck at poker, I don't really play. I liked watching you guys play, and um, that was just such a good day. It did. It felt like a like a sleepover. Yeah, know? that that night too. I rewatched that set like five or six times. It it got better and better and better. And I was doing <laughs> harmonies, singing along with some of the harmonies. I told yeah. Dickie too. He's like, let's re-record one of the songs. I was like, <laughs> I, I, I like that song. But um, I'm planning on coming down there when you guys are set up. I know you're still like um, in, under construction and working on something with you and Pete or yeah. vice versa. Yeah, we just actually, it's funny you said that. Um, just in the last couple of days, we started um, rolling on some new songs and everyone's kind of like, put, that's how this band works, how the Defiant works. It's like someone has an idea, they send it to another person, they put their part on, they send it to me, I put my part on, I send it to Joey, send it to Dickie and everyone kind of throws their their stuff in the stew. So. Who's writing the new stuff? Who who's who's kicking it off? Johnny, our bass player, Johnny Rio, um, came with with a pretty cool song that he and Dickie had been working on. And uh it's amazing, you know, and I mean I knew he was creative. I knew I he's the one that I don't know as well as the others in this band. I, he was the last person I met in this band. And uh he wrote this cool song, and so we're gonna we're getting that rolling this week. Um, Pete wrote a cool song, our drummer Pete Parada, and that's getting rolling. And I'm like, shoot, I gotta get off my ass and catch up. You know, these guys are passing me up. Are they sending you completed packages, like three part songs with with chorus, verse, pre chorus, bridge, and then you add on like strings of sound, or do you actually write parts? Um, it's it's different every time. Like Johnny sent me an acoustic version of his song, and then he sent me another version of the same song with Dickie singing on it. Um, Dickie does his vocals on his cell phone and then sends those. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And uh, Pete sent me something that's just drums, piano, and him singing. And I'd never heard him sing before. It was pretty darn good. So. Oh, that's that's hot. He definitely, he's, he's getting the message across, and so. So what these are is like sort of like blank canvases for the rest of us just to put pile stuff on top of. Did you, in all your years in bands, did you ever, because I've had been in two different types of bands. One type is like, you trust, you know everybody, you trust them all because they're all so awesome. Everything they all do is good. Mm -hmm. And it's just yes to everything. And then move on to the next song. Yes to everything, move on. And then other bands where people are like, are trying to to kind of constrain the, the stuff and be like, wait, play this instead on that part take that out move this part here and like kind of so do you have a preference and have you like what have the bands been like that you've been in well i mean um in smash mouth i wrote i wrote the songs i just wrote all the songs and i, I basically demoed all the songs myself in my studio and those guys replaced all the parts that i played is is kind of how that band worked unless somebody else brought a song in which wasn't very often um, the bass player of Smash Mouth is a fine songwriter. And so, you know, he would bring songs in that that were usable and and we could, you know, work with. Um, sometimes, you know, our singer Steve um, would bring songs from outsider song outside songwriters in and we'd tackle those too. But for the most part, I just wrote that. In this band, everybody is contributing equally. It is a just such a great uh, balance, you know? And plus it just takes all the, a lot of the weight off my shoulders, you know, and everybody else's, you know, where everyone is firing a hundred percent all the time and they're, and they're great ideas. And, you know, we're seasoned vets. And so we know what we're doing these days. What bands other than Smash Mouth were you in like before and after that? Um, before that, I was in a band called Lackadaddy, which was sort of a hip hop, rock metal punk band it was kind of a little bit like rage against the machine meets beastie boys um and then and then it was smash mouth all through you know late 90s and 2000 aughts and um you know other than that i've been in not really that many bands you know i was in a band called sun drones for a minute we were on island records and um that just kind of fizzled for some reason but 
I, I thought I was done with being in bands until until these guys came along. After what what was that one called after Smash Mouth? Sun Drones. Sun Drones. What were they like friends of yours? Yeah, I was a guy that um, I met when I lived in New York City. We wrote a ton of songs together, and uh, I moved back to L.A. He ended up moving back to L.A. We started this band, and it got a record deal. And it was like, wow, I can't believe that happened twice to me, you know? So. What was, was Smash Mouth an L.A. band? Uh, Northern California, San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, did you guys move, or were you always up there? We, we lived in San Jose and Santa Cruz. What happened? So you left the band? Is it was it like a sensitive issue? I don't. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't. Uh, really Smash Mouth. Yeah, yeah. I left in in two thousand eight. What um, happened? It just for me kind of ran its course. Um, you know, I thought that Smash Mouth had a, a certain brand. You know, like we were just talking about, like the Walking on the Sun thing in the sixties, sort of fun and sun surf rock vibe. And um, some people in the band were were ready to move on to other genres and i was like well why you know it's like we have we have this this is what people want to hear you know we have this brand and it's this part of the market is we kind of have it cornered just keep on doing that you know and uh it, it just it got out of my hands and so i, oh. I didn't feel necessary anymore i guess that kind of happened i think in in uh, an accelerated pace with Izzy Stradlin and Guns N' Roses, and it's probably a totally different situation. But he mm -hmm. wrote—I uh, don't know if he wrote all the songs on Appetite for Destruction. He—he he was like the, the kind of the general central creator of the force. But then yeah. Axel became so famous, like the lead singer tends to become so famous mm -hmm. that they feel like they're the ones that are running. Or I don't know if they feel like it necessarily, but like Eddie with Pearl Jam, Eddie Vedder, all of a sudden is like the most famous guy, even though mm -hmm. you know Stone and Matt McCready, Mike McCready are like creating all the sound for the most right. part. Yeah, but and then um, did that? I don't know if that did that happen with Smash Mouth too. Like the the power dynamic shifted in the band over Th time. That that is it's a real thing. The whole lead singer, um, guitarist who writes all the song power struggle thing is real, you know. And it's like it's gonna happen, you know, unless everybody's being creative, you know. If the singer's not a songwriter and he's not being creative, you know, he's gonna want he wants all the publishing money and the writer share money. And the guy writing all the songs wants the success. It's just natural. You know? Is that be is that because the so the songwriter gets the publishing? So how does that work? Like you come in there with a completed song as the guitarist with all the lyrics and everything, mm -hmm. but then the singer sings it, so they get like percentages of the sales. Yeah, there there are, there are two sides. There's there's writer share and publishing share, and so it's a hundred percent and a hundred percent, which creates two hundred percent. Kind of weird, very confusing. And if, if a songwriter wants to keep 100% of that songwriting because he wrote the song or she wrote the song, that's totally fine. But to share the publishing is what you're supposed to do. So that's that's how that band worked, you know? Only I shared everything. I shared writers and publishing. And so, you know, and so when things kind of started going sour and fizzling out, I kind of went, huh, maybe I should have not done that, but. Interesting. You know, the, uh... Uh, you too, I think, does that. They share it five, everything five ways with their manager. It's the four guys and their manager. At least they used to. I don't know if it's the same manager that they mm -hmm. used to have. Yeah, Paul McGinnis. I never knew that they cut him in on publishing and things like that, but I knew that they shared everything equally, and that's why they stayed together this long. Yeah, dude. Yeah. And the Beatles, I know, with Paul and John, I mean, they co-wrote and just put both their names on everything, Lennon McCartney, Lennon McCartney, even if one of them came in with a song. And then the other guy was like, yeah, yeah, I'll go ooh, wah, wah, ooh, wah, wah, ah. <laughs> and then they're like, yeah, Lennon McCartney, Lennon McCartney. Because yeah. it establishes like that tightness that the, the audience wants to see. They're like, I love that you can work together. But in reality, I don't know. So going back, would you do it again? Would you split everything or would you be more? What do you think? Well, that's that's the funny thing. It's like, you know, th that's how we're doing it. We're doing it the U2 way, you know. Uh, in the defiant we're we're definitely we want to stay together and we are pals and we love each other and we respect each other and everyone puts in the, what what they're going to get out of it you know in other bands that i've been in it seemed like i was doing the lion's share of the work and they were mad at me for not sharing as much as i should have or could have i meant so you when you say the lion's share uh, was it mostly writing was that like the bulk of yeah the i mean it's it's kind of like this like the, the the cycle is 
a songwriter goes and writes these songs and then the band gets together and they go and record the album and then the whole band goes on tour and then it repeats you know with a lot of other factors you know in there but that songwriter is doing that every single day every minute of the day is is working and working and working whereas sometimes the lead singer gets to take all that time off until it's his time to come in and sing and then go on tour and so there's all this time you know that's being spent working and it's not exactly always fair how do you so what do you how do you write man like what is your process now or uh, the whole time has it changed over time too there's two questions every song is a little different i guess you know i have this thing called uh, the 5 a.m club and i'm the only person that is in that club and that's so i can get up in the morning and have these fresh ideas because I, I write mostly like right when i wake up because i feel like i feel like i'm drunk or stoned or something you know because i'm just waking up and um i'm not drunk or stoned just so you know <laughs> but it just it has this you don't have anything clouding your mind yet you know you don't have your cell phone your the news isn't on there's not a kid there's not a dog there's not a you know spouse you, all you have is what's happening at that moment and so i get all my ideas out of me first thing in the morning and then i'll go back and then i'll go do my thing whatever and then i'll go back and like listen to these ideas and go oh that one i'm gonna i'm gonna work on that today and so like, that, that, that's kind of how i do it later in the day you'll go back to your 5 a.m ideas yeah. and then be like this is the one like around what like in the afternoon or is it later do you stay up later um yeah just whenever i whenever i can you know I got this thing. Wait, I want to check. I'm um, I'm vibrating. I'm vibrating at 417 hertz right now. I got this Rife machine. I don't know if you're familiar with Royal Rife. He no. was a. Uh, it's this. Can you can you hear it? Yeah. You got a tone. That's 417 hertz. It's two of these gigantic copper coils that are hooked up to this transistor that are plugged into uh, my this which has an app on it, which I've set up a, a playlist of frequencies. These are the solfeggio frequencies uh, aligned with do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, da. And it's like 417 hertz. It's going to go up to 432 next and then 528 after that, then 639. It plays three minutes of each. This is just this particular playlist. And then these copper coils vibrate at that frequency and you can kick the amplification up to the point where you can hear it vibrating, the copper. And it goes, Woo! like you hear the, the resonating tone. Whoa. What, I mean, what is what is the purpose of this? Well, Royal Rife was a scientist in the 1920s working on healing people with frequency. And he mm -hmm. apparently healed seven out of eight dudes that people came in with cancer. He healed a bunch of people's cancer. And if you look online, you can read about different frequencies affecting the body in different ways. Like they'll kill different pathogens, different types of cells. And uh, you can kind of. Apparently, it's like a type of medicine. I mean, it feels fucking good, dude. Wow. Wow. Yeah, if you're tight, if you're stressed, it hurts. It's like, oh, it's almost like it's adding to the tension. But if you open up and relax, you can feel it like vibrate, like soothing your system, different frequencies. That's and, amazing, man. I'd like you to send me some info on that. Okay, it's the real rife machine. I think it's real rife machine.com. Let me real R E A. Yeah, it's real. Here, I'll, I'll see if I can post this in the chat too, because a lot of people keep asking me about it. Uh, it was Matt Rife sent me a little guy. Here, I'll show you the little guy. So I showed you, I showed you the big one. That's the, uh, the main, the, the beast machine is like for fifty five hundred bucks i think this little guy's 420 dollars okay. it's this and it's similar thing except instead of these gigantic copper coils that i showed you here it's the little copper wrap this thing's like 420 bucks they call wow. it the spoonie and it's cool too but you do not you don't get nowhere near the amplification that you get on these big guys and so that's just sitting down what is it sitting on the floor or is it on the desk it's uh, on the desk next to me i've got there's two of them so let me see if i can show you Two of them. Here, I got them both wired up right next to each other. Oh, I think the frequency's gone up to 432. <laughs> yeah, you heard it. 432, man, that's the key of C. And, dude, what I've noticed is my pitch is on fire. When I listen to this stuff, I sing. It's mm -hmm. real easy to stay on pitch. Huh. Like, my, it's real pure. My voice comes out real pure and, like, directly on pitch from hanging out with these sustained frequencies do you just keep it at 432 no it oscillates you can i had it at 432 for like four hours one night 
And uh, but right now I've got it on a Solfeggio playlist, so it's going up the playlist. Next it'll be five twenty eight. Wow, for three minutes. I think it goes up to like nine hundred and sixty three, and then this it'll is go some back. super nerd shit. You know this, right, dude? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm like, thank you, baby. Uh, it's like Nikola Tesla, Royal Rife. These guys just thrill me, man. People that talk about vibration and understanding the nature of how like chimatics, cymatics, and which is basically how vibration alters uh, form. Are you familiar with the cymatic science? Nope. It's with a C. It's like chimatics. It looks like it's with cymatics. And what they'll do is they'll take like rice on a platform and they'll they'll hit it with frequencies and cause the rice to vibrate. And it takes these different patterns. Have okay, you ever seen yeah. video of that? Yeah. And I could pull one up maybe really. Let me see if I can pull one up. because it, Yeah, that, that's always just fantastic to watch. Yeah. Man. He's this I, I got into it about 2009. I'm going to turn this down and then share my screen here. And uh, ever since I was like, oh, I didn't know that this was like this happened. But apparently when you so here they're taking 345 hertz. This is just music, but you can see they're yeah, they're vibrating this platform thing. Uh, with a certain frequency. This is 1033 hertz. And then it, the the rice. So I, this is like a two dimensional uh, result. This is actually like a three dimensional shape that we're looking at a two dimensional bisection of. So like these frequencies, I want to do it in like three. You can do it in three dimensions, too, with like bubbles and stuff. And, and they go like they go in and out. They're like pulsing this shape. Dude. It's just kind of the dude. That is so cool. Yeah, I have seen this before. All right. I could I could play this all day, but. I've got to talk about music. Okay. I mean, I could, well, I could leave it well, on too. It's fucking cool. It, if you think about it, you know, send me a little whatever whatever info you have. I'd like to check out the thing, the coils. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. The real Rife machine. Um, I'll send does you it, that. Does it heal pain? Like, like instead of taking an ibuprofen, it. I I I don't know if if technically it's. I can't say that it does heal. I think because it's not tech. I'm not a doctor, and it's not technically medicine but mm -hmm. it it feels like it is if you're in the right sh position like if your t neck is tense and forward it, it hurts it worse but if you're mm -hmm. like aligned it feels like it heals faster huh. and there's different like playlists for like healing cancer healing acidosis healing lymphoma like different types of cancer healing um like any ailment you can think of there are there are frequency playlists that tech are supposedly heal it I don't, I've gone through, I did like stomach acid was a good one. It landed me on 230 Hertz and all of a sudden I was stretching and like, you know, when you stretch and it, it hurts, like you go, you stretch real far and there's that like residual, like, Oh, okay. I got to let my body rest for a minute. Cause I just stretched really, really far. Mm -hmm. It, the vibration was like, was like enhancing the, um, the cool down. Like I, I, it didn't hurt it. Like the, um, the repair was really fast. And I think it was like doing something, maybe doing something to the acid coming hmm. out of the muscle hmm. i mean it's really anecdotal i don't know right. but i don't think it was psychosomatic because i forgot the machine was on and i was just stretching and then i was like shocked shockingly like whoa i can stretch again all of a sudden 20 seconds later i didn't have to wait a minute right. uh and then i realized might be something to it all right i'll uh i'm gonna email it to you now before i okay. forget thank you yeah the real rife machine I'm just on, I'm so glad. So Matt Reif is uh, the he's like the grand the grandson the grandson's cousin of Royal Rife or something, and Royal was the scientist that. Right, I wish see. my name was Royal, dude. What time were you born on April second? By the way, shoot, I can't remember. So I was pretty young. <laughs> I was. I think I was born at 419. You know, I, I'm going to find out because it, I know, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I want to say that I was born early in the morning too. Oh, really? Yeah. Hey, anybody that's watching that wants to get in some super chats, please do a rumble rant. I wanted to shout those out too. And just making sure the show is live on rumble. Uh, we're, we're good to go. Let me get this out of the way. Uh, all right, back to it. Like that. Uh, 
What do you got planned the next uh, couple weeks? Well, um, I'm going to do, I'm actually playing on Good Morning America with um, an artist that I work with named Jackie Ivanko or Jackie Ivankovich, but goes by Ivanko. Um, she was a child prodigy opera star when she was 10 years old. And now she's in her early 20s and she is making this super cool. I, I wouldn't even know how to categorize it, but we, we're making some cool music together. And um, she's starting to gain some traction and get some radio and we're going to go do a little morning show. So I'm doing that next week. Um, the Defiant is doing um, the FLCCC event that's happening in Phoenix um, on the third on February. What's, what's FLCCC? You know, I don't know what it stands for, but um, it's a bunch of doctors that are um, all aligned. You know, basically questioning. You know, oh, frontline COVID critical care alliance. Cool. There you go. Um, yeah, so they're they're having an event, and there's going to be a lot of uh, panels and speaking with doctors that are you know standing up against same kind of things that we we're standing up against. You know, medical freedom and you know not sticking things with people with things that they don't know what they are and expecting to cure the world. Yeah. I was telling Vivek Ramaswamy about that. I thought medical tyranny is like one of the biggest risks humanity has to face for itself. Like letting uh, totalitarians just medic in, like the Nazis used to do that shit too. Like they just mm -hmm. experiment on people and he, cause he, he owned a pharma company and I think he's like, Holy shit. Sees like how dangerous it can be now. And like yeah. at the time, he was just like, I just want to make the most money I can and, and find the best drugs to heal people. But yeah. hey, no joke, man. Right. You gotta, and you got to be vigilant against it. You can't just sit back and be like, finally, we figured out what's good. And now we can trust humans to do what's good. Like, no, you got to be the one. Yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of people are definitely have their eyes open now, you know, after what we just went through in the last few years. And so, um, yeah, hopefully. I thought, oh, what's that? Nothing. Come on. It, it's like a, it was like a, a psychological inoculation. What humanity just experienced since 2020 was like, yo, not only did we like lock. Really, it was the covid stuff more than like the covid lockdown. It wasn't the covid. It was the response. The government like mm -hmm. lockdowns and stuff. And people just kind of passively let it happen. A lot of people did. And now they're like, what did we let happen? Then, yeah. then it turned out COVID had like a 99.6% recovery rate or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And that most of the people that were suffering and dying had other comorbidities aligned with it. And it's like, yo, what in the fuck did we just appeal to authority and just let them just yeah. steam steamroll society's policies. And, and I know so many people that are like vigilant relative to where they were four years ago. Well, absolutely. Yeah. So. Did you guys have, did you have personal issues with, the COVID response and did you like have to were people trying to get you to take a shot and well so from that, your job or anything? um no not not from i, I was kind of working on my own at home i was just producing doing film and tv and um so i didn't really see anybody nothing it didn't pandemic didn't really affect me it just sort of affected everyone around me um so i guess it did affect me but it didn't directly you know and uh you know we homeschool our kids we were we both work at home and we were stuck in we lived in california and we were sort of stuck in our house and all, and our you know there was the big divide you know the people who just went and did what the government said they should do and there were people like us who did not and question everything we want to know what this was you know and what are the you know long-term effects and and nobody knew but they were still saying you know you need to get just get it why don't you just get it and we're like, no, we're not going to just get it. And we're not going to stick our kids with this shit either, you know? And so, I mean, that that was kind of probably happening everywhere. But we ended up leaving California. Um, that was a big reason that we left. Oh, wow. So we had you we been still, there? Was that? Huh? What, were you, what were you saying? So we we were there, you know, and the, the lockdown never stopped. You know, they said it was going to be two weeks and then it was four weeks and it was six weeks and it was eight weeks and it was a few months. And then everyone was freaking out about toilet paper and nobody knew what was going on. And, you know, people started, you know, they basically divided people, you know, and um, and we're like, well, we don't need to be here. 
you know, a lot of our friends left uh, California. And so we bought ourselves an RV and jumped in that thing and traveled around the country and realized that a lot of other places like Idaho and Montana and Georgia and, you know, now Tennessee is where I live now, um, weren't putting their masks on and they were calling bullshit and they were going shopping and they were going out and they were saying hi to people and shaking hands and, you know, they weren't hiding in their houses with their masks on and rubber gloves like they were in California. No offense, California, but really, you know. Yeah, uh, I went out there in 2020. It was real sad. People were like sitting outside with masks on trying to eat. And then like it was really weird because I'd lived there for a decade before yeah. that. And it was just like, wow, it feels gray. California feels gray. Pretty dark, you know. And um, we still have a house there. Um you know, once in a while we go back and it's like, we're only there a few days before we're just kind of like, Egh! there are still people, you know, tripping out. And that is freaking weird. Do, what, you, how long were you guys there before you left? Um, we were there all through 21. I think we left, I think we left towards the end of 21. Um, were you there for like a decade or, or the whole time, like back before even Smash Mouth? Were you just stayed in Northern California? Well, so, I mean, I grew up in Northern California, but, I, you know, I moved to L.A., I don't know, in the uh, around 20, right when I left Smash Mouth, around 2008, 2009. Yeah, that's when I was down there, too. Oh, six is when I got there. Oh, five. Yeah. That was a good time to be in L.A. It was real exciting. A lot it of YouTube, it's when YouTube kicked off. I started doing YouTube videos in 06 and I kept <laughs> on all these YouTubers move to LA. Let's start a revolution. We're like in control of the media. This is the new media. And all these people started showing up YouTubers right. and we that kind is, of had like a movie. That was exciting, wasn't it? Yeah. Those, those YouTube movements were, there's just an internet video in general is just such a powerful organizational tool for good or evil. And obviously yeah, you know, mass sure. formation, it just enhances the ability to formate. So, dude, wait, you guys left California? You just all, the whole family got in an RV? Mm -hmm. How many kids? Uh, two kids, uh, a cat, a dog, two fish. The, and whole, the whole band? The, the whole crew, yeah. I mean, we, did, we traveled around and, um, you know, if we found some place that we liked, we'd stay for a little while, stay for a few weeks or stay for a month. Um, we liked Georgia, and so we stayed there for a few months. Um, we liked tennis. We liked Nashville, so we stayed for three months. And then we're like, well, let's go check. Let's go cruise around a little more. We went to Austin, just cruised around. And we went back to LA and uh, we went, okay, this is definitely not the place after being at all these other places, you know? Like, so anyway, we came back to Nashville and we've been here for three years. Oh, okay. Like right away, you got back to, to, to LA and you were like, what, within like a month, you were like, let's just... Probably not even that. Yeah. Yeah. Man, you think you'll ever... I mean, it's kind of a weird question if you'll ever go back to California. Well, we, like I said, we still have a house there. And so and we it's an Airbnb and, you know, we let friends stay there or we Airbnb it. And so what, how old are your kids now? F uh, 13 and 15. When they then they play music, too. Um, when they feel like it, they're very talented and it, and it pisses me off because they're so good. They're so much more talented than I was at their age. And they're like, eh, you know. They're great singers. They can play piano. They have great rhythm. You know. Did they watch you growing up and like play with you as like little kids? They, I mean, a little bit, you know, they're, they're, they're not as interested. You know, one of my kids is, is a lot more visual, you know, she's, she's an artist, you know, and they both love to draw and paint. So, you know, I let them do whatever they want. You know, if they want to play great, if they don't, that's cool. Oh, okay. Do you guys have, you guys written songs together? um a little bit we do this thing like at birthday parties i get i get a, a big dry erase board and we say okay we're gonna write a song what do you guys want to write a song about and all the kids say birthday cake and i said okay birthday cake you know what are the things you like about birthday cake and then we start writing things down and then we start you know forming rhymes and stuff like that and i have a guitar and we just do like these basic songs and, and they always come out great because when you have like 20 kids writing a song, it's going to be hilarious. Is that how you write? Do you pick like a topic and then like kind of figure out some things about the topic and then make rhymes? Not usually, you know, I, I don't, I don't, 
I don't normally, it normally just kind of starts, you know, happening, you know. Some people think that songs are written and they're up there in the ether or the universe and they find the vessel, you know, to realize whatever the song is. And so I, I think that you just kind of have to be open to whatever creative ideas are happening when lightning strikes. Yeah, it's like, I mean, this conversation is a sort of song, like I'm, we're in a communication that's not like pre-scripted and it's coming out very um, cogently, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and and so songs are kind of like that with God, like, or with an idea or like a piece of whatever it is, mat, dark matter or whatever your thoughts are. And you're kind of just like communicating with it in real time. It's nice when it rhymes, when it just- uh, Absolutely. I, I do have like my notes on my phone. And if I think of something that sounds cool, like that could be a cool thing to say someday, you know, I'll, I'll throw it in. And so I do have a folder full of cool things that I want to say someday. I went through like about a 12 year dry spell of writing. I would write, but like the songs are more mechanical. They were just coming out like, this is what a good song would be like. And then I would <laughs> sing it and it's like, I wasn't emotionally invested in it like I was in 2006 and seven when I was just like breaking up with one girl of seven years, getting with this new girl that was just rocking my world and like totally emotionally unavailable, but like high every day on weed and like feeling every minute of it. And mm. the songs are so, so fucking good. Yeah. And then so I, I was talking to my buddy who's this um, producer up in Montreal, Momo uh, from the Momo Zone. And I was like, why? I, I was in, I was interfacing with people so regularly in 2007 and writing all this music. And why have I not been able to? He's like, because you were feeling their pain. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. So I I thought of this girl who I know who I, I has been feel, I thought I had been feeling a lot of pain with her. And so I, I wrote about it and it came out and it was so real and raw and felt so good. But now when I re-sing that song, I'm like transported back to the pain. Mm -hmm. And it's that tortured cycle of the artist i have you long story question short do you write like emotionally painful stuff have you avoided that throughout your career or do you like throw yourself into it no i i actually prefer to write emotionally painful stuff um hidden and masked with with funny little pop music you know like a, a landscape of this shiny surfy sound with pretty deep hurtful painful words yeah rocks hey all star that song i'm gonna all it's an easy one to pick at because it's such a big hit and it's like my world's on fire how about yours right and i'm like and whenever i'm singing it around the house I, when i say that out loud i'm like geez am i manifesting this world just fucking catching up catching on fire <laughs> or may, maybe but like, yeah i mean it's like yeah it's definitely about climate change and bullies and you know, not being good enough and being a loser. That song's fucking sad, dude. Was was Walking on the Sun also about climate change? It was uh, just like the burning of the earth or something? Um, that one was a, was inspired by the Rodney King riots and the, the Rodney King incident particularly. And the way everything just went, you know, a bunch of steps backwards at that very moment you know it's like we were the it seemed like society was trying really hard to you know be hate free and be you know racist free and all of a sudden that one incident just fucking took us back to the dark ages and that and so i'm like well there goes that you know i guess people tried and then it just it was it does feel, it feels like that like we overcome racism and then all of a sudden for some reason there's another ra bout of racism. I'm like, what? I thought that in like 09, yeah. we figured it out that it was about eyeballs. And like, it's not really, I'm not saying that we aren't genetically different. Like our ancestors, whatever they did in their lives, their nutrition, their, mm -hmm. their locations, their behaviors directly impact the genetics of their children and then yeah. their children and so on. So like our genetics are inherently, a lot of us are, are different, you know, genetically, but like, that's not racist. Racist is saying like one's better. In my opinion, big R racism is like saying one's better than the other right. uh, implicitly. And like, I, well, I don't know, you know, it's like, it's hard to say if it ever really went away. It's just that it was covered up and people were like playing nice. And then all of a sudden it went boom, you know, and, and now it just seems like it just never, it's like nobody tries anymore, you know? Yeah, it was in 2016, all during that election, that political election. I noticed, man, I don't know if Don Trump said something 
like race he didn't he wasn't being racist but like he was like more direct about and like i guess obama had kind of primed people about being black and being white and how like it was a thing because mm -hmm. like we, people weren't really talking about that during the bush years and during the clinton years and race was kind of I don't know. It just felt like it wasn't a big issue. We were like all people. I was hanging out with people from Mexico that didn't speak good English, but you just look in their eyes and you can listen to them. And like, we were all yeah. one. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know why it's there. It's just bizarre, you know? And so you were like, I want to buy the world a toke. <laughs> that song's so <laughs> good, man. Do you ever sing these old songs? Do you get them in your head still? Or like uh, playing? Sometimes, but you know, for a while there, it was hard to escape All Star just because it was just you know saturated. You know, every all the memes and everything. I don't get. I thought Walking on the Sun was a better song. I oh, me too. Yeah, it's such a good. It's like such a like a, a genre defining moment because it's like electro pop, but like electro surf pop or something. I, yeah, i would never heard anything like. I mean, I guess like Sugar Ray kind of was in that vein. Mm -hmm. Um. In fact, I was listening to it, and a Sugar Ray came on on the playlist. They they put so maybe that's why they were fresh in my mind. There was a little bit of that, but not the surfy stuff. Right. Was, you know, like Sublime kind of had it a little bit. I guess they were surfers too. It seemed like the the California bands at that time in the late '90s and mid '90s had a, a a thing going on. There was a thing, you know. And we our first tour was with Sugar Ray. We're we're pals with those guys. Yeah, they play with Tonic with uh I think from um. Better than Ezra, the dude from Better Than Ezra, mm -hmm. and um, Emerson Hart from Tonic, and uh -huh. I think the dude from Sugar Ray. I don't know their names. Right. Uh, I think they're in a band right now, or they were. Oh, they, they, they started a super group. I think so, man. Emerson, dude, I, I do you know those guys at Tonic? Did you? I, I, we've you know known each other on the road over the years. I when I was eighteen, we went to I got invited to go to a tonic show, and it was like I was just this nerdy high school kid. But we went. They played with the Verve Pipe, and then mm -hmm. afterwards, my friend had had Emerson's shirt because she worked at Blossom Music Center in Ohio, and where he'd left his shirt, and so she was like, "We're gonna give you your shirt, Emerson." So we met up with them, and they were like, "Come hang out at the hotel," and it was like this is real dude it was like the fourth wall was broken it was before internet video where you really had a chance to talk to your heroes like interface mm -hmm. is so easily now it's very very easy to throw up a video chat or a twitter space and like have a conversation but back then it was like it, it just felt like them like famous people and me kid right <laughs> and i was like oh shit there's like yeah, I, approachable yeah and, and they were really nice that was like also inspiring like when you now that you're older and you're famous and you're you're influential like be very kind to the young people that are that are there that are like experiencing your presence because they'll remember i i remembered it i mean so so vividly to this day i had a sticker on my boom box that they <laughs> signed and all that right and uh it was just like, great great memories you know when you meet your heroes and they're cool you know it's kind of, it's, it's not it's kind of rare you know yeah, I hope I hope it becomes more common. Did you ever back in the day where you there like people in the industry that you started to meet that you were like, holy shit, this is getting real? Oh yeah, oh yeah, man. It's like, you know, I, I was a big fan of the band Blur, and when my manager called me, he's like, hey, guess guess who you're going on tour with? I'm like, Blur. Oh well, yeah, and so and then you know meeting Damon Albarn, who now Gorillas. You know, I was just a huge fan. I still am. And so, yeah, and he was super cool. Um, we toured with Lenny Kravitz. We toured with U2. Um, what else we did? We toured with uh, NSYNC. <laughs> and those guys are super cool. They're, they are not what you think they would be. Those guys, uh -oh. are, they, they were party animals, man. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. I love Blur, man. That, that I got that. I think it's their first album, that orange one with the blurry dude on the cover with uh -huh. number two, song number two and Beetlebum and all those. Yeah. That was one of my main. That, 20... was, the tour, that was the tour we were with them on. Was that like 93 or 90, 94? Uh, well, no, that was, um, that was 98. Was it really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Dang. Did you ever get into like Third Eye Blind? You ever hang with uh, those dudes? That's a good question. Would you like to hear? I would love to. <laughs> so yeah, um, we're all from the same area, and their first album was produced by the same guy that our first album was produced by, and we ended up going on tour with them. And 
I like some of the guys in the band. Let's put it that way. And uh, th there, there is a one very, very difficult person in that band. Let's see if you can guess who that is. I wonder who it is. Yeah. Um, was it just like a heroin fueled? Heroin? I don't. Was was the lead singer on heroin? They sing about bumping and and taking the hit through the nose. I'm like, is that a heroin song? I can't figure. Yeah, out. I mean that that sounds like a cocaine thing. Interesting. But, yeah, more of a cocaine. But anyway, thing. it was yeah, it was. He's a difficult person, but um, everyone else in the band very cool. Was back in the day. I haven't I haven't yeah. heard from him in 20. People obviously change. And but some that's such a weird man. When some like lead singer rock stars, I've been that guy just difficult to work with like i'm not gonna sing your lyrics you wrote that you sing that part i'll sing my part i'll add to your lyrics and he's like no 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 i want to write you this song and you sing it and i'm like no i'm a purist <laughs> get over your ego and then they fired me that was in a band i was in called the panic oh, really? had a lot of yeah i had a lot of potential the, the guitarist wanted to make it like you too he's like i'm like the edge man i'm gonna write the songs i'll give them to you you sing them and i was like if i don't believe the words i'm not gonna say them out loud kind of mentality doesn't bono write the lyrics he probably does yeah yeah but i think that that's how that band works i think i think the edge puts music together and probably melodies and bono fills in the blanks because i mean he he couldn't sing someone else's lyrics so passionately or i don't think you know he he owns that stuff man dude they are like do you ever listen to the war album you too well yeah i like october boy um war uh what was their third album um or fourth album was it unforgettable fire or joshua tree joshua uh, tree. might have been was it joshua tree it was yeah. one of the two and then unforgettable right up to fire. like right around then unforgettable fire joshua tree yeah. after that they kind of lost me and when we went on tour with them it was the pop mart tour and it was all you know kind of synthy and you know clubby and all that stuff and i i had already you know they were like U2 was like one of my favorite bands of all time when I was a kid. And so to go on tour with them was like unbelievable. I was completely honored and to watch them play every night. But, you know, I, I did, you know, fall off years well, before. That was the Zuropa. That was after Joshua Tree. Yeah, it was Unforgettable Fire, then Joshua Tree, I'm pretty sure. The yeah. Zuropa album got real electronic. Yeah. Like I love that song. Zoo Rope is wild and Zoo Station. Uh Zoo yeah. Station's hot. My friend used to make fun of it when it would come on. It'd be like, ooh, Zoo Station. I'm like, dude, it's just I love it. I mean, it's Bono, you know, he's like feeling every word. Yeah. Um, but it was totally different compared to Joshua Tree and uh Joshua Tree is with like one is I think a, a lot of their huge hits yeah. were off of that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of like the book, you know, like I bought Bono's book, and as soon as you know they're kind of early years ended in, in the story and his story. And he kind of started getting more into, you know, politics and, you know, the things that he's into, which I'm total, I'm so happy that he's into that stuff. You know, it's great for him, but I, I stopped reading the book kind of the same way as I stopped listening to the band once they, their story changed a little bit musically. And so I just didn't, I didn't relate anymore. REM did that too. When they got real uh, with uh, what's the frequency, Kenneth, off that monster album, I felt like because they were really like guitar and, and drums and bass in uh, automatic for the people. And then things got electronic and like, very, they, very they, produced, you know? Yeah. And I, it was sad. I think um, Coldplay also kind of went that direction. They got very electronic. I love their first album. And, and that's about as far as I went. was that rush of blood to the head. That album it, is lights it was, me up. Um, Parachutes was their first oh, yeah. album that I know of. It had yellow on it. You know, it's the first thing that you yeah. heard about Coldplay. I, I love that. I love that album. I still listen to it. Dude, Bono, when I, it was in 2005 when I found out that he had gotten a bunch of debt forgiven to some African countries. I was like, the, he was the inspiration of why I started making YouTube videos. I was like, hmm. one guy can influence the earth in that, that much. I can do that too. Yeah. And so I, I felt like I had like confidence because of Bono. Right. Yeah. That he's, and re he's inspiring, that? you know, he's inspiring human being. Yeah, man. I've only ever watched him from a distance, but what a, what a good job as a human, like yeah. one guy. And like, I, I was watching some stuff about in the beginning. He was like, I couldn't sing for shit in the beginning. And like, it was like kind of funny how bad of a singer. And I like, 
relative to where he is now. But then at some point in the stage work, they, he just figured it out. He figured out how to let it rip and let those high notes come out. Right. Have you heard his son's band? No. What's it called? Shoot. I'm not going to remember. I just had my wisdom teeth out the other day. and I'm Oh, kinda, yeah. Uh, what, how, how's the recovery? Uh, it's going better than they said it would. So, well, Did you get them yanked out or cut out? Um, one of each. <laughs> okay. Uh, his band's name is called Inhaler. Yes. Bob you got to check so... him out, man. I mean, for one thing, he, he, it sounds like, he sounds like old U2 Bono, for one thing. He sounds like the first two albums of, of U2. And, uh, and it's good, man. And I'm, I, I don't think that he's resting on his father's, you know, coattails. I think he's, uh, I think he's very, the band's good. Dang, I'm going to cue it up at YouTube and listen to it after this show. So, like, I had my wisdom teeth out a long time ago. I had them cut out. The bottom ones were cut, surgery. Mm -hmm. Top mm -hmm. ones were yanked out. The top ones healed really fast. The bottom ones took a couple weeks. And I still have big gaps where they were. Mm -hmm. and I remember, I mean, I don't want to put make people queasy, but I they didn't put me under. Did they put you under for yours? I had to. I, I mean, they've been, uh, Dennis has been trying to yank these things out my whole life. And so, you know, now I'm in my 50s and I decide, okay, I guess it's time. I had, I actually had to do it. Was it like causing jaw pain or something? Causing some issues with my other teeth. Yeah. Dude, they, for me, they left me awake. I was like, I thought everyone went under for this thing. So they left me awake and they were digging them out. Like I saw pieces of bone flying out of my mouth where there's like, like yanking and like cracking them off. I was like, God, did she go? Oh, oh. Yeah. oh, and then they stitched it up and it bled for days. And uh, I missed like a, a canoeing uh, excursion, <laughs> I think is the result. Are you still, are you still bothered by that? I'm still so, thing? I'm so pissed about it all. <laughs> just those yeah, motherfucking. I, I told them to knock me. I said, just knock me out. I don't want to know. I don't want to remember. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. Just yeah. wake me up when it's over. And <laughs> Give me some pills, you know. I, I so, so are you on like on Percocet or something? Just trying I to actually did, I, I didn't even end up taking the the stuff, the good the fun stuff they gave me. I didn't even take take. I just you, are you I've been proven eight hundred for first couple days and now I'm fine. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's the way. I, I remember taking that Percocet shit and it helped, but at what cost? I don't know. I yeah, don't know. I know. It's just it, it makes me too kooky. Did you see a lot of that? Like people just abusing pills and shit in the industry mm -hmm. in the early, I guess in the nineties and stuff, it was a little more, were they even around at that point or was that kind of pre pill? Well, there, there, I, nobody really knew about Oxycontin. I don't think back then, but and Molly's and whatever people are into now, but um, you know, there's a lot of blow. There's a lot of booze, you know, that, that was mostly what was happening. Not pot. Cause it smelled lots of pot. Oh, there was yeah. lots of pot. <clears throat> Shit, man, we've been going an hour. I think, uh, oh, I had a super chat I wanted to read. This was right. a uh, this is from Coach Chisel four thousand said, uh, "Much love, Ian. What's your favorite books?" I can't... Um, I look. Are you asking me? Yeah. Um, right now I'm reading the uh, Rick Rubin book, which I love, and I'm taking it very slow. Um, what the fuck is it called? Uh, the uh, the Creative Way, I believe it's called. Um, it's helping me actually stay, uh, out of that writer's rut that you were talking about earlier. It's like, it pulled me out of it so hard that I, it's like, I'll be reading that book and I'll have to put it down to go write a song or go paint or go do oh. something. Um, I oh. highly recommend it for anyone who's creative. I love that guy. Yeah. He's like an example of where, what I am when I'm in my alpha prime musical yeah. mind state. Yeah, man. He's he he has a lot of good stuff to say and you know a lot of it's taken from you know buddhism and you know all the things that have been said before but he's putting it into the creative form and it's just it's amazing have you worked with him before no never met him he'd be fun to produce some stuff with he would be fun you know i, I hear that you got to leave your electronics and your shoes at the door and you got to you know not talk to your family for a few weeks and just he he just says you are here in this space now and you're here to create and nothing is going to get in the way of that. You know? Wow. This, that's a big this book is the same way. Oh, yeah. nice. It's one of the reasons I get up so early in the morning. Oh yeah. shit. Because of this book or just because of like the concepts within that are, you're reimagining every time you read it. Well, I, I've been doing it before I started reading this book, 
but um but i mean it's it's just such a good way to get up and be alone you know and meditate and not have any outside shit coming into your brain so you can so your creativity is wide open you're just like creating until you turn your phone on <laughs> or until someone else wakes up Dude, these things are magnetic man especially when the screen goes on uh there's like a different kind of force i've got on my bed i've got this like it's, it's like a threaded nano silver sheet that wraps around the bed it like and then you zip it and so it's mm -hmm. like around the mattress and then it plugs in but it, it doesn't have two prongs they're just like plastic prongs it's got just the metal ground um in the plug uh -huh. so you plug it in and it just discharges energy out of the bed into the into the power grid so you it's like sucking energy out of you and discharging mm -hmm. it and apparently it pulls what's called far infrared or it might be near infrared um, but you can feel it like draining you kind of like if you ever have cold sensitive tooth, like that's mm -hmm. sensitive to cold, that kind of pain. It kind of feels like that, like it's being sucked out of your body with that kind of sensitivity. And when mm -hmm. I have my phone, it, when I'm on the bed, I can feel when I turn the phone on, I feel like more energy getting sucked out of me. So this it's not just it come, it's like when it turns on, when the screen turns yeah. on, there's like. Right maybe it's just the, i've got three monitors in front of me right now like just yeah. over and then i've got the rife machine turned on and i've got a charger here and the camera yeah you got that. your you got your emf covered there dude that's a whole other conversation emf dis distraction right do you do you shut it off while you're working at the house um i shut it off at night i turn my phone off at night and i don't want it near me um, we don't have any outlets near our bed or anything like that. We're, we're not all the way where you are, but I'd like to know more about that. In fact, my wife would probably really love to know about your, your energy sucking sheet zipper. Oh, thing. it's awesome. I'll send you a link to it. Okay. <laughs> all right, man. That was a good show, dude. We tore through it. Yeah, man. Anytime, man. I'd love, I, I can't wait to see you guys again too. It's like, like I said, that was one of my favorite days of 2023. I'm thinking yeah, about flying down there to Nashville. I'll let yeah. you and Pete know. It would be like in probably within the next month or so. Okay. What, whatever's good for you, though. When you're maybe when your studio is like ready to fucking actuate, we'll get in there and it, make some sound. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna start tonight. Actually, I'm gonna put it together. It's one of my favorite things to do is set up the studio. I love when I set it up. I love doing that part of it. Why are you? Do, are you like the sound will bounce off of this wall at this angle if I'm sitting here, kind of? normally but today i'm just gonna see what the room sounds like and then i'll start doing stuff greg camp ladies and gentlemen always a pleasure my dude and for everyone, 2024 y'all go buy that, a record that's actually uh, to check out greg's newest music the defiant it's going to be the defiant official.com is where you get the album this band's rocks and there's an episode of timcast iro of the defiant you can find dickie barrett i think will be in the title uh that was really enjoyable because we have that that oh, extra so studio set up where you guys played the set, it was just yeah. so good. Yeah, the harmonies. Yeah, that was fun. All right, everybody else, like the video, subscribe to the channel, share this with uh, your friends and relatives and loved ones and everybody else, and uh, I will be seeing you later. See you, man. Bye. Thanks for having.